So let's look at the mathematical implementation of the random spring network. It's really straightforward, it's only a couple of lines of code, so it's relatively straightforward to explain what happens as well. So first of all, I define four fixed points, or what it really means, define the coordinates of the four fixed points in the plane I'm going to be looking at. And the, those points are the four corners of a square, minus one, minus one, one, minus one, minus one, one, and one, one. Then I need to decide how many free points I want to connect my springs to. In this case I choose 30. I think it would be quite interesting to try out a few things just to see what happens. So essentially one of the questions I'll ask you is to see what happens if the number of points changes. Then I just need to define a number of free points and what I do to make my bookkeeping really straightforward. I give those the coordinates x, i and y, i. No big surprise, for i equals 1 to points. Now the most important part is the thing that actually defines my random network of springs. So I do two things over here. I ignore first of all the join and the delete cases. Let's concentrate on the word table over here. I make a table of roughly two and a half times the number of points, so in this case that's 75 inch things which contain three elements. It contains a random reel, a random choice from the free indices, and another random choice of the free indices. So what that really does, it says random reel will be my strength of my spring, the spring constants, the stiffness of the spring. Uh, random choice free is whatever spring I connect to whatever other spring. Now there's one problem. I mean, if you make a random choice like that, sometimes I make the same choice twice, and that means I connect a particle to itself and that spring doesn't act. I could include it in the list. It doesn't contribute, so it doesn't make any difference. But to make it slightly neater, I actually delete those springs that connect to himself by essentially deleting the case where I've got a pattern with an arbitrary number in the first entry, so the random real is arbitrary, but the second two entries just are the same pattern, so they're equal, which really means I'm connecting the same spring. Then the next one I do is I also connect the springs to the fixed points. So again, I make a random choice of fixed points and a random choice of a free point, and I connect it with a random real strength, which I make slightly stronger than the one in the first case. The slightly stronger is just because it's easier. So what I've just done, I've defined this point is connected to that point. That's it. Now, in order to find the equilibrium positions, I need to find the place where the force vanishes. So in order to work out where the forces vanish, I first need to work out what the forces are on a given point. Now, the one disadvantage of the way I've stored my network, my network is not organized based on the points that connect, it's just essentially a combination of several points. So I need to select from my network all of those cases, which is why the word cases comes in here, where either my point x, i, y, i is the beginning of the spring, well, in this case it's actually, or the other way around, is the end of the spring. Since it makes no difference whether it's the beginning or the end, actually I make my life easy by swapping things around, by replacing, essentially putting the final point second and the point I'm connecting to last, so they, I know that my last point is always my point x, i. So once I've made a list of those points, I just take the first entry for each element of the list, and the first entry is the strength, and I take the second entry, which is not the point I'm looking at, and I subtract the final entry, which is the point I'm looking at, and that's indeed a sensible definition of the force of a spring on a particle. And the m% makes this a function, the hash makes this elements that actually act on the list after that, and backslash add really means I apply it to each element of the list. So I've got a list of lists. Each short list contains three elements, but a longer list of all the points that connect to this point xi. So for example, if I look at the forces 1, 1 looks like, you can see that 1 is connected, is for the x in that case, 1 is connected to the first point, to, to one of the corners, and I've to the 15th point, the 25th point, the 26th point, and the 27th point. Why that way, I don't know, but that's just pure luck. Uh, so I've got all these equations, 
and then I need to solve them. So the equation is that all of these forces, both the x and the y component, are zero. And in order to make it a neat flat list, a list essentially with not multiple elements, essentially not an array, but a list with one index in there, flatten is a trick that Mathematica uses to do that. I also need to tell it what variables to solve it with, and those are clearly exactly the coordinates that are free. Now, there's a risk in solving this, and what you may notice if you actually change the number of points, that to some points there is no unique solution. Why not? Well, because there may not be enough conditions to determine all the positions. So that's just how quick it goes. You just ask it to solve it. Uh, I'm not displaying the solution, but what I do instead is I plot it. So I plot in the plot below, and you may well want to see what the instructions I have. I've given over there. There's some quite a few interesting mathematical statements over there. The big red plots are my four corners. The slightly more pinkish points are the points where the strings connect. And the thickness of each green line is actually the strength of the string, the stiffness of the spring that connects those points. Uh, as you can see, you get quite a cluster in the middle, but some points move quite further out because this point is clearly only connected with a very weak string to any other point and a rather strong string over there, so essentially it balances out. I, of course, could have calculated the energy in each spring as well, and that would be quite an interesting thing to do. Uh, just to try to work out not how strong it is, but essentially try to work out what has happened over there. Um, you can clearly see how complex this is. So, finally, what have we done? We've start, we've just, by solving nonlinear equations, we solved a very, very complex problem, which we couldn't easily solve in any other way. So the numerical solution of differential equations, linear equations is crucial to what we've done over here.